Tenemos ya con nosotros a Bárbara uh -huh. y tenemos también, eh, we've got as well um, Athena and we've got Paula as well. So I, th I think we've got everyone for, and Easy as well. We've got everyone for the, um, for the panel in this afternoon. Um, Mariano Paz is our colleague from Liberty University. Um, I know for certain that he wanted to be here with us. And unfortunately, you, you cannot be here for reasons that are beyond your... Um, your means really um, but thank you for being online with us and for sharing this um, final panel in the training school we're coming towards the end of this intensive three days um, we've got a fantastic panel and then we we're going to watch a lovely film as well an animated film Giuseppe but um, for now uh, over to you Mariano with this uh, final workshop panel and as you remember the, the format is five minutes presentations and then five minutes uh, responding to those presentations from the authors, and then the rest of the 20 minutes or so to make it 30 for each paper. Conversation, discussion, Q&A. Over to you, Mariano. Excellent, thank you very much, Jorge. I will ask then uh, the uh, different panelists to uh, be mindful of the time. I will uh, put up notices or gesture or do something if I need to to check that, But but, if you if we can start by then yeah the panelists themselves being aware of the time uh hello everyone i'm really sorry i cannot be there uh yeah i was caught up with things in my own institution uh i did uh, manage to listen to bits and pieces of the uh training uh, session or school over the days it's been amazing it's been excellent and uh all the extra, you know, um, issues that happen from the gas leak to the uh, winds passing, you could not have a more eventful training school, I would say. So, uh, doubly sorry that I am uh, not there in person. Hopefully, I'll be uh, able to do that next time. So, let's start then uh, without uh, more ado. And our first speaker uh, is... Um, Barbara Fernandez Mecheda, who is assistant professor in Latin American studies at the University of Hong Kong. She's a literature scholar with a specialism in Chilean uh, or uh, um, contemporary narratives, see, narrativa contemporanea chilena and poetry. She has recently received a three year grant to conduct research on speculative narratives from Chile, contemporary narratives from uh, the year 2000 to 2020. And she completed her PhD in Hispanic studies at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, Barbara will be uh, reading uh, the presentation prepared by Athena. Is that correct? Barbara, are you ready? Uh, yes, I'm ready. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Okay, if yes, I yes, may. We can, we can hear you very well. Yes, Barbara. Okay. okay. So, Maya just present Athena because you will be reading Athena's papers and then we will move on to her. So, Athena Al Chacido is assistant professor at uh, Masaryk University uh, in Brno in the Czech Republic. She specializes in Hispanic studies, particularly in history, culture, and society of Latin America. In her research, she focuses on the literary and oral traditions of Central and South America, including indigenous orality and other traditional manifestations of uh, indigenous ethnic groups and other minority communities. She's also a literary translator, has translated from Spanish and English, and she's interested in the translation of comics and the use of comics in the language classroom as well. Okay, so over to you, Barbara, please go ahead, five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, um, I was really glad to read Athena's paper because um, I wasn't aware of the text that she decided to study, which is uh, the graphic novel uh, Dark Room, Memoir in Black and White by Lila Quinteros Weaver. Um, I was interested in the way that she wanted to connect past and present, uh, especially uh, with regards to racial issues in the US. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to be very useful uh, with her comparative proposal because she decided to, to do it with um, uh, with a text uh, dealing with, with the Roma people, uh, which um, I'm not an expert on, so I, I'm afraid I cannot talk about that too much. Um, but from the perspective from US Latino Chicano studies, I think uh, there are a few things to say, uh, and I would like to know your opinion about this, Athena. Uh, first of all, um, 
this visual buildings, Roman, uh, that you're studying, uh, reminded me immediately of the House of Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros, because it's a text that even though it's not a graphic novel, is also set in the 1960s, even though it was uh, published in 1984. And it is a Chicana buildings Roman from the perspective of a young girl. So I, I see a connection there that could be very interesting. Um, also, you talk about uh, the graphic novel as a testimony. And since the author is Argentinian in origin, that also uh, made me connect with the tradition of testimonial writing in Argentina in general. Um, I, I wonder if this is something that you would be interested in delving into, uh, the connection with Argentina itself, even though the author, I, I understand, was not living in Argentina by the time of the dictatorship and when this sort of writing took over. But if you're interested in memory studies, that could be a, a, a great way to connect it. Uh, an aspect that caught my attention from, from your corpus is also the fact that um, the Quintero's family in, the, in this graphic novel at some point uh, blended with the white people from the community she's describing. She's describing this community in Alabama um, at the time of the social rights movement. So um, I wonder if this memory of this in-betweenness uh, gets solved in the text and how do you see it? Because in the end she was also um, watching segregation. And, and a point that caught my attention as well as a sort of a parallel reading, which may work or not, I don't know, this depends on you, is that the author is from South America, but then she went to the South of the United States. So she kept herself in the South, uh, like a double South. So I, I found that um, interesting and, and, and fascinating in that sense. Uh, since I couldn't read, uh, many examples um, from the text. I wonder um, how your proposal connects the past and the present, um, because the part of the past appears, I think, clearly in the graphic novel. But how do you do you think these aspects resonate with this testimony and and the present in the United States as you wish to study it? So um, basically, that's. My reading of your article, I find I find I found it fascinating, and there I think there's plenty of room to explore from that particular text. So I I I, I found very rich uh, ideas, and I hope my comments help you in in any way. Uh, it was a pleasure reading you. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for that. And um, sorry uh, because I can't see uh, if uh, Athena is there with you. Yes, I'm here. Okay, I'm excellent. Present. So over to you, Athena. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, reading my paper and presenting it in this uh, interesting way. And thank you very much for your suggestions. I found them profoundly uh, useful. Uh, I would like to share with you uh, my uh, presentation. And if it's possible, I'll... Uh, answer during my presentation the questions, or uh, should I answer directly the questions now? Uh, well, uh, because uh, I would prefer to present my presentation uh, because some of them go directly there, so I won't be saying things twice, and I won't be saying I've already mentioned that. So uh, it will be just uh, two in one. Is it okay, you, Barbara, if I answer that in that way? Sorry, my, yeah, my only concern is the timing, no? Because then there will be less, less time for questions from the audience. But if you could do it, no, rather speedily, would that be okay, Jorge? It, what do you think? It will be in five minutes. Perfect, okay. perfect. I think that is a really good idea, yeah. No perfect. Worries. Yeah, so uh, I can't see the presentation, though. Yeah, and, and but I can't see it here. I mean, uh, okay, okay, okay. I have to, okay, I, and which one is it? This one, okay. Share, okay. Okay, okay. 
So uh, once more, thank you very much, Barbara. And I'll be very quick uh, in presenting what I've prepared here. And I would like to uh, answer your questions while presenting. Uh, this is quite interesting because Lila Quintero Weaver uh, is, as you've mentioned, uh, a lady from Argentina who uh, as a child has moved to Alabama and she has forgotten her Spanish. Uh, so once she was adult, she decided to uh, make her own autobiography, uh, remembering those days when she, uh, with her family, went to, uh, to become part of the American society. So that's why uh, that's the recuerdos, uh, that means memories. And this autobiography actually uh, parts from memories, but uh, it's uh, an, a very important component. Uh, there is history, history with capital H, as well as history, uh, like this uh, history of common people, which does not form part of books of history or on history. So she's starting uh, to write her biography, uh, which she completes with visual elements and she draws in pencil, that's her drawing. Uh, and she starts to do it from the child's perspective, which is completed uh, precisely on the basis of all those historical events uh, which uh, form part of, their, of her own life. And of course, she completes it with her uh, own adult person's perspective. Um, that's very important because we have this double perspective here and she does it from uh, the point of view of pictures, either films, or either um, photos because her father filmed and uh, have taken uh, photos. And she remembers that as children, they were looking at those pictures. In, um, in the 60s when they arrived, the social movement has started. So she's looking at what happened at that time, but as a child, these um, moments, historical moments, are for her uh, on the same level as pictures from her everyday life. So I would like to um, have a look at this from the Tropics of Discourse by Haydn White, who says in interpretation in history that any historian, and now we are not speaking about a historian, but uh, about a normal person, but uh, everybody does that, uh, that's what I want to point out, that if you have to think about a historical period, you can't tell it uh, in a sequence of mo moments uh, objectively. You ha always have to interpret. That means you have to uh, highlight one point and omit another. And that's the question what do you highlight and what do you omit? Because you have to fill the space in between with your interpretation. And there is this double perspective, very uh, interesting. And that's the same in the house in Mango Street you have mentioned, Barbara, because it's the same. Uh, because you just remember your childhood or the, the, the main character remembers the child, but from the perspective of being an adult. And uh, the testimony uh, actually is precisely uh, this uh, moment, which is that important because uh, you tend to uh, pay attention only to things you remember strongly in any way. So um, this is like a way of uh, making one's life into a movie or a series of pictures that uh, Lila Quintero does. Uh, what, what she wants to do is to see her identity as a Latina, but uh, from the point of view of being integrated, that's what you have mentioned, uh, but integrated only partly 
because uh, there is also a beautiful picture inside where she, as a child, sees black and white. And she's uh, thinking, but I'm neither black nor white. Where do I belong? Uh, there should be some space for me. And uh, as she comes from one South to, uh, to another South, this idea of double South is really quite interesting. Uh, it's just the, the perspective that the Argentinian South is looking at Alabama as a North. So the, the uh, US South is a North for the Argentinians. Uh, but once there, it's converted into the South South. And that's uh, how she reconstructs her memories. And if you look here, she says, uh, it's very probable that when we went to school with my um, uh, brother, we haven't noticed what was going on. And if you look uh, there, so there are those Negroes launch, um, uh, those, uh, all those uh, registrations and everything that's happening, but from their perspective as a child, it's here. Uh, at that point, she hasn't paid attention to it. She was, she was playing. But now, when as an adult reconstructing those memories, she's just giving it the, uh, let's say, the value it deserves. And she always combines those real historical facts with her, uh, with her childhood and things she wanted to do. And that was what she was playing with. And that was she was what she wanted to look like. Uh, but being uh, aware that that's not uh, the place that she will belong to uh, in the future. And uh, this, this look of uh, the child who looks at the pictures taken by her father during the protests, and this is the very last part of my, my micro presentation, uh, that the whole graphic novel is precisely like that, that if you um, look at the movie and then you go uh, like back, backwards, it's that um, uh, gift that was opened, you have it at the beginning. Uh, and if you go backwards, then the, the, the paper which is destroyed uh, suddenly becomes again uh, the nice paper that uh, decorates the, the box with the, 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 uh, with the gift. And what I want to um, show is precisely this, that that's what our memory does. We leave something and we have it like a, like a box with a gift. Uh, we open it and then we have this paper, which is not nice to look at. But our process of recording uh, and trying to remember and trying to restore our uh, memories is just trying to make nice that paper again and have the idea of what happened. And yes, how that does fit with uh, uh, the past and present, uh, because precisely, um, the past events can serve as some as a referential point uh, to something we live now. And in 2020, where, when uh, the uh, this let's say um, whole situation in the United States was very effervescent because of what was happening uh, after George Floyd's uh, death. So. Um, suddenly you look at this and you see that it's uh, the history repeats. There is always something that uh, gives the, the impulse to uh, another, another uh, movement and uh, that uh, the, the incentives can be the same. And I hope I have answered all your questions. I uh, have that. How for, uh, the House of Mango Street, the testimonial part, the integration, which is only 
partly an integration, the double south and the past and the present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Athena. Uh, I don't know if Barbara has anything to say or we can open the, uh, um, this to the floor for any questions. Uh, I'm fine with, with proceeding and thank you, Athena, for, for paying attention to the comments and replying to every one of them. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm sorry, but I don't have an excellent view of, of the room. So if uh, whoever wants to go first, just ask because I won't be able to see hands. I don't have that kind of detail here on my screen. Uh, it's me behind the screen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Athena. Uh, first of all, uh, I didn't even know uh, about this author, about this work. And as a matter of fact, I uh, asked for it to the Ibero-American Institute in Berlin, and now they bought it. So mm, thank you. Thank points, you. Points, thank points you. for you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I am. Um, I wanted. Uh, there was. Uh, I just happened. Maybe you're, you already know about this, but there was recently published a, um, a dossier in uh, from American Studies uh, Review, uh, which is called Archives of Resistance: Picturing the Black Americas, and it's it might be quite useful for your uh, research. Thank you. And the other uh, my course, suggestion is. Uh, if you uh, happen to know about Michael Rothberg's um, multi-directional memory, it's, I think it's his latest work. I think it might come in handy mm -hmm. because um, when I was reading your um, proposal, one of the things that I was thinking about is like, these are two very different cases, you know, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, African-American people in, in the US and Roma people in Europe, which is of course they, uh, it doesn't mean that you can't connect them. Mm -hmm. The thing is, how do you connect them without making it like, like forcing it? Mm -hmm. And Michael Rothberg is exactly talking mm -hmm. about that. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's this thing in memory studies and, and mm -hmm. memory in general, which tends sometimes to be kind mm -hmm. of a, even a, a suffering competition, mm -hmm. you know, who suffered the more, mm -hmm. the most is the most important fact that should be remembered. So it's a very difficult thing. And mm, I think it, it's interesting that while well, you're trying to connect these two very uh, different uh, processes, but also that in both cases, it, these things that are happening and are being seen through the eyes of somebody who's not sharing, who's not part of that culture or not even part of that society. And it's mm -hmm. an Argentine uh, woman uh, talking about this and what's going on in, in the US but also uh, what's going on with the Roma people from an uh, Eastern European perspective, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. not Roma. Mm -hmm. So uh, you uh, maybe you should, I mean, you emphasize that, I think more in the first case than in the second, it would be interesting to do that. And, but also do it in a way that, you know, makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. because it's different in time and space and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and ethnic, if you mm -hmm. want ethnic dimension of it and also politics, but that doesn't mean that they cannot be related at all. And that, that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. and that's what I thought. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that will be very useful. Thank you for the suggestions. And as to the comparison, that's what, uh, when I was brainstorming my ideas with my uh, colleagues, they have mentioned the same, but the Roma case is something completely different. Uh, and uh, the, the, the situation um, described in Quarto Oscuro, it's, you can't compare. Uh, but I think, why shouldn't I? Because it's discrimination, it's racism, it's segregation, and it has no, uh, I mean, it's not different if the nationality or ethnicity of the uh, persons who suffer from that differs. It's the same, the, the consequences are the same. And what I want to, to show is that the mechanisms are the same. Those, the, uh, let's say the society is different. The values that uh, are um, in those societies are um, somehow defined may vary quite a lot from what we have in Central Europe. 
the historical um, uh, experience in our case, uh, like an ex-communist country, uh, we hate that <laughs> because it's 30 years uh, after the communist uh, regime has finished, but it's still there. But that's the fact that we can speak about that right now. And right now, the Roma question is being considered a problem because there is a huge understanding for the uh, situation of uh, African Americans. There is no understanding for Roma people because you have them in your house and everybody will tell you that's different. And in what it's different, it's the same. And that's what I want to, to show or to prove, to, yeah, to show. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question about intermediality. What's the connection between drawing and photos uh, linked to memory? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can develop this idea that you suggested. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, thank you very much, Agatha. Uh, yeah, actually, at the beginning uh, of this, mm, let's say, graphic novel, what she does, and I have shown some of them here, uh, she's taking real pictures. This is her passport. Well, actually, I have to mention that uh, thanks to Karina Vasquez, which is a friend of us, uh, I had the possibility uh, to know Lila uh, Weaver, and uh, I, uh, we had the possibility to ask her about how uh, she decided to uh, elaborate this graphic novel, what were her um, motivation and uh, goals. And she mentioned precisely that, that she really started from the pictures, but there were some pictures missing. And she mentioned that, uh, I think that it was in the very first uh, that there are some pictures, but some of them are missing. And those that are missing, she does them, she paints them. Uh, for instance, if you look at the first one, no hay imágenes de mi transito. So she makes it. But there are pictures of some situations, uh, moments in her life. So she uh, just makes the drawing according to the pictures and takes this, uh, let's say, aesthetics to, uh, to elaborate other, others, yeah, thank you. Yeah, just a comment as well for, for Athena. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it, really interesting uh, work and your analysis. Um, it made me think about a few things we have been talking and debating in the, during these past few days. I mean, what is the, the, the importance of context uh, mm -hmm. to resurface again important areas you know that that need to be looked at uh, as you mentioned you know the the situation i mean the killing of 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 george floyd mm -hmm. um again brought to the fore the importance of this uh of this graphic novel of of these debates about racial issues and tensions i mean and 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 that is that is significant in my way you know when i was uh, talking yesterday with colleagues i remember talking to gustavo how at a certain moment you may read a piece of work and have a, a certain you know impact on you, but you may read at a different time with a different context, and it may have another much bigger significance, yeah. or it can entirely change actually your way of understanding that work. And that that is that is significant in the mm -hmm. process of readership and also create and, and the creation. And also, you show a really interesting uh, slide: the one about the um, collectibles, the one about. Um, playing with games. Um, another one. Again, another one, that, that one. I love that one because it also connects with many things we have been talking about on, on how to define women or, and also things that extend beyond the realm of comics. You know, Agatha mentioned intermediality, where we can talk about transmedia things. This is the realm of games, of gaming, of, of toys. Um, so it's inviting the reader in a way, right? To, to position yourself there, you know, to change the dresses and things. So I, I find that really interesting, um, how this 
goes beyond mm -hmm. what is um, conventional comics, so to speak. Mm -hmm. If that exists, mm -hmm. there are no conventional comics at all. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, something that, that caught my attention. I mean, this, no, this thank slide. You, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. I wanted, if I may, to ask a very quick question, Athena, but you'll have to uh, answer very quickly. You made a compelling point that in the comparative analysis, no, both both uh, texts have deal with uh, discrimination, with racism, with otherness. Uh, so it's clear that politically you can see the connections, you know, on a narrative terms. But uh, what about visually, aesthetically? Are there any connections? I would love to see some images from the, you know, Czech graphic novel, but I don't think you have any there, no? Uh, actually, I do not have any there, but uh, from the visual part, uh, it's uh, it's in black and white as well. That's why uh, the idea came to me to, uh, to pick up this one. And uh, it's also made in pencil. So uh, there are, let's say, at, at yeah, uh, that it would be nice to, uh, but I'm sorry, I I haven't prepared there. No, it's fine. Just something that would be interesting to 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 know mm. more about, but uh, we'll be well waiting. Sorry for a forthcoming uh, mm -hmm. paper or uh, book or whatever it is you uh, out that you you're thinking about. Shall we move on then uh, to? Uh, the following um there was there was the, own, sorry there was a um um a hand raised by oh sorry yeah i cannot see it please yes go ahead um, yeah thank you for a really sort of interesting paper reading it through um one of the other concepts coming off the back also something like say multiple extra memory that i think might be interesting to interrogate if you want to pursue this comparative study is looking at this through notions of something like racialization so looking at the way that racialization comes through in these texts and thinking of these methods of oppression fundamentally as things which are generated as processes, I think possibly could be a helpful angle to take. Because what I think rightly sort of would be understood is you don't want to make direct mm -hmm. comparison between, say, the exact situations, because as I think anyone would recognize those situations are very mm -hmm. different. However, looking at processes of racialization mm -hmm. and deconstructing that notion mm -hmm. of race, I think could be probably a really helpful thing. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of bits of reading I can send across and that I'd be more than happy to. Well, um, but thinking of it in terms of those processes, I think would be a really helpful thing to keep this paper going and take that comparative study even further. But thank you so much for a really interesting sort of perspective. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. Can we then uh, move on to the uh, second presentation? Uh, we are inverting the roles uh, now. So thanks, Jorge, for uh, stop sharing the slides. So now um, Athena will be commenting uh, and presenting on uh, Barbara's paper. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm here trying to put, uh, yeah. So uh, I'm really very glad to uh, present this very interesting, uh, text by, uh, by Barbara, uh, I must say that I haven't heard about uh, this, um, let's say, comic, uh, and I found it extremely interesting. Uh, it has to be said that it's quite complex, so uh, I'll try to do my best uh, to present Barbara's text uh, that we had the opportunity to read. And I've just picked some uh, from her text, some, uh, let's say, uh, parts that I would like to uh, present uh, and then to associate with the questions I have. Uh, so as, uh, this comic is a sort of a dystopian, chaotic and mystical Santiago de Chile. So this is one of the very important parts because we are in Latin America, where as Barbara says, the locus is very important. And the, one of the first images is the image of the Virgin Mary, which can be uh, important and interesting to see in connection with some uh, issues that are treated uh, in, in the comics, in the graphic novel. Uh, there is the importance of time travel because the main character um, oscillates, the, the narrative oscillates between layers of time and the main 
character pa uh, passes from past to present and future uncertainties. I like that expression very much because uh, it's very uh, uh, precise and apt. Uh, so uh, one of the uh, uh, parts that I consider very important, and this is a uh, quote from uh, Baradit's text, is this one. God makes white clouds and they reach us beautifully from the sky. The black clouds are of our making and they ascend with their pestilence from the guts of our machine. And that's, uh, as Barbara says, uh, the uh, ethos of Baradit's proposal where uh, the idea of the creator um, where uh, could be considered not only as a deity, but uh, the creative power of the human uh, where the things are related to human activity and pollution uh, contrasted to nature, which is beautiful and pure. And uh, this separation is uh, very important uh, when reading the text and considering the important part of its uh, message. Uh, and what I find uh, interesting, Barbara mentions, the basic binary oppositions between white and black and between bodies the, that are human and machines that are manufactured to generate a hybrid sort of lives. And uh, then what is the karma police policing? Well, they have to track uh, souls when jumping from re reincarnation to reincarnation, and they are supposed to reveal crimes. So this is very uh, interesting. And that's why uh, there is the importance of fabrication of uh, agents who are a mixture between uh, human and machines. So this is all from Barbara's text. Uh, and the interesting part of that is the heroine who is uh, actually half human, half, uh, half machine, and who actually here can uh, see the, uh, her role in, uh, in that, uh, let's say, story which is being presented. Uh, what I find also very interesting is how the cultural elements are included into the text with the, uh, in this dystopy, uh, with the consumption of ayahuasca, uh, where, which permits this travel, uh, this traveling through, uh, through the time and space. So, so uh, this is quite uh, important because here we have these uh, approaches to the becoming machine, which uh, is again uh, related to the fact that there is this feminine element to uh, this uh, character, main character. And uh, I really like the way that Barbara mentions whether uh, this fact that the body of a woman, woman is turned into a cyborg, uh, which is tasked to kill humans, uh, would not the law of robotics apply here? That's what uh, Barbara asks. And uh, then the sacrilegious imaginary, there are very many very interesting uh, examples of that. Uh, that uh, can give us an idea of what's going on. And yes, the syncretic uh, aspect of uh, some elements that are being introduced into uh, the text are quite interesting. And uh, for Baradit, that I find personally very interesting, America is a, a, a rhizomatic chaotic accumulation of great aesthetic beauty. Uh, a continent that lives in a perpetual nightmare. And uh, just to finish, to conclude that, uh, paradoxically, uh, the, the main character 
is a part of the karma co uh, police who is just seeking or sh sh she should protect the freedom uh the freedom she is allegedly uh she allegedly protects is denied from her and then finally there is this role of hers which forms part of a collective uh goal and finally we see here the gesture of subjectivity uh because the heroine known as number 47 uh, by the end of the text, uh, and Barbara says, pardon being a spoiler here, leaves her team alone, uh, whispering and shouting, my name is Mariana. Again, if we remember uh, the importance of Virgin Mary, uh, so it's quite interesting. Uh, and my questions very quickly, whether the rhizomatic uh, approach is being somehow reflected in the structure uh, of uh, the text, or whether we can see any component of the other approach, the arboristic, if we just take the Deleuze uh, approach. Uh, then uh, the, the binary oppositions, uh, to what extent these oppositions, humans, machines, uh, artificial creatures, cyborgs, and on the other hand, police agent and hunted souls, to what um, extent this is influenced by the fact that the main character has this um, female component, whether it's reflected somehow there, and finally, ethical questions and moral aspects whether uh, is there any evolution in the main character that we can see that there, there are some notions of uh, ethical thinking, let's say. Uh, and yeah, the travel scheme time. Uh, you have mentioned uh, in your text some examples of reference to uh, of references to realia and historical events. I would like to ask whether there are more uh, cases that you can trace or see or somehow uh, understand that in this scene, there is an allusion to something that really happened or this thing is a reference to a realia real, which is connected to the Chilean uh, society. And that's it. Many thanks, Athena. Barbara, I think you have uh, I know more than enough questions for you to reply to. <laughs> uh, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. Now, thank you, Athena, for your for your careful reading of my text. Uh, as I said, it's just some preliminary notes on, on a couple of readings I did. And I was focused on a few points. And your questions are really helpful. Um, there are some of them that I cannot answer to right now, like the first one. Um, but um, I think an aspect that is I, that is relevant that has to do with Latin American identity and expression is, is the aspect of the excess. Um, the text is very excessive in, in everything, which I, I don't relate so much to the, to the rhizomatic reading, but I, I, I connect it more with a neo-baroque uh, mm -hmm. aspect of Latin American expression that it's that it's there. Um, um, regarding the gender aspect, um, I would say that um, all these mixed characters in a way are sort of created equal. So they are always uh, uh, turned into cyborgs penetrated in a way by different machines, by different instances. Uh, with limbs being taken, and then uh, could I share my screen to show one page from yeah. the from the comic book? So let's see um, if I can do this. Can you see this? Yeah. 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 Okay. So you see here are all of these penetrations I I, I talked about in the text. Um, it's in the genitals. It's in the hands. Here you see. Uh, so, so this is the process of transformation between uh, uh, one of the selected children uh, that become uh, karma police 
and then uh, when they have to go and, and complete uh, their work. There is a gendered uh, allusion that has to do with the fact that women may be better at channeling all of these energies uh, and that time traveling may be easier for them. Um, I also interpret this um, uh, from a Latin American perspective as, as the figure of, of, uh, of, a, of a female witch uh, that is characteristic to some, some cultures. Um, and the other aspect is, um, let me remember what you were asking me. Uh, the hunting, uh, unfortunately, I cannot say anything about the gender aspect re regarding the hunting because the whole novel is about one particular hunting uh, exercise in which uh, the main character, it is suggested that she finds herself as a child as well when she was abducted and maybe she was hunting her own father. Uh, this is not very direct but uh, it gives you an idea also of, of the other intricate layers of time traveling and so on. Regarding uh, ethical and moral aspects, there are clearly a lot of them uh, from a variety of reasons, uh, which is why I think there could be firstly a theological reading of the text regarding the aspect of creation and the human creation which ends up destroying everything or destroying the creation of God, the figure of the Virgin Mary, because it's a very important landmark in the city of Santiago. And also you spotted this in the name of the character Mariana. Mariana is also the main character of another of uh, Baradit's novels. This is his only graphic novel. All the others are narrative texts. And it's a novel called Yggdrasil. Um, so the character there is also uh, called Mariana and she also has to, to drink hallucinogenic uh, substances in order to uh, find her truth, etc. So this is something that goes through Baradit's uh, work. Um, but I found this novel very, very, very intricate and complicated to analyze. So going back to uh, moral aspects also is this decision that uh, Mariana does not to continue completing these uh, tasks assigned to her uh, and she escapes. This is the only way you see any hope in the text. There's no hope at all for society. Um, and finally, if the events versus uh, the fictionalized world, I think it's difficult to say. Of course, there are aspects of Chilean history that appear mentioned there that you can uh, remember that there was a dictatorship, the figure of uh, Alberto Hurtado, this saint that is being milked for his, uh, for his produce in order to help uh, time traveling is also a very important image because it kind of surpasses uh, the emphasis on Catholicism but at the same time puts it at the center. Uh, in the picture I show you uh, for a brief moment, there were also Catholic signs, there was a cross, etc. So we have this um, syncretism, religious syncretism that is characteristic to, to Chilean culture in which also you have ayahuasca and also in other texts you may find uh, Mapuche heritage and so on. So all of these are aspects that I would have to study very carefully one by one, but I think this text is very rich. And I think it also talks about something that is very common to contemporary uh, Chilean narratives. And it's the fact that there seems to be a reality in a perpetual present that cannot be grasped, that it's really dark. And that's why there is this idea of a perpetual nightmare. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's about the whole of Latin America uh, or the whole American continent as Baradit suggests, but at least from a perspective of Chilean narratives, there is a sense of inescapability. And in a way, uh, Mariana's gesture is trying to escape uh, by going back to her roots, by going back to being human and saying, no, I will not do this anymore. In the end, that's, that's kind of the, the dilemma. So I hope I answered your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. That's excellent. Um, I would say don't mute yourself because now we'll go on uh, to, uh, well, taking questions from the floor. Sorry, one quick question before. Uh, you keep mentioning uh, Chilean narratives. Do you mean uh, novels, graphic novels, cinema in general as well? Or could you sort of clarify that? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll clarify that. I, it has to do with my my current uh, research yeah. project. I'm I'm normally analyzing uh, the relationship between literature and neoliberalism in Chile, mm -hmm. and when I refer to Chilean narratives, I refer to Chilean narrative texts, especially okay. novels. Right now, All right. written between 2000 and 2020. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this is the only graphic novel I'm taking on in the project, so this is kind of exception to the rule in a way, and also it's the only graphic narrative by Barat. Perfect, thank you. So who has questions? I'm sure there will be a few. We don't have much time, so please go ahead. <clears throat> I wanted to ask her if um, she knows about Operación Bolívar by Mexican Edgar Clement. Um, it's uh, it's uh, it's a graphic novel from 1995, and it has a lot of similarities with uh, what you are talking about in Karma Police. Edgar Clement imagines a post-apocalyptic reality. He mixes all this uh, technology with the fight between the Nahuales, the pre-Columbian Aztec cultures with uh, Catholic religions and all this. There is uh, a very striking image of Virgen de la Guadalupe and is pretty much an analysis of the Mexican culture, is pre-Columbian traditions, and is the same, it establishes a parallel between, for example, what they do with the angels the angels in this novel are like, uh, are like uh, mm, they are murdered and used to produce uh, a, pot a very uh, powerful drug, uh, mm. angel dust. Uh, and you have, for example, uh, very, a lot of references to Mexican popular culture. Chingere is, is the, the drink of the devil. Uh, so, and, and the reflection in Clemens' graphic novel is exactly about a post-apocalyptic future in which nature has been destroyed, in which uh, it also has a lot of resonance with uh, environmental studies, uh, uh, syncretic uh, cultures in, in Latin America. I mean, uh, neo-baroque, you have these pages in Clement's graphic novel in which you don't have absolutely any, any free space it's like this uh, horror back way. Uh, and, it, and it has been called also a new Baroque uh, graphic novel. So I was listening to that and I was thinking, wow, it's, it's so similar to Edgar Clemens, which by the way, it was published in 1995. So um, it would be, it, it would be first, right? Before, so, but, but, but it also points out to this kind of, post-apocalyptic imagination in uh, Latin American uh, narratives, right? So very interesting, thank you. Uh, thanks Thanks for that. Um, I'm actually not someone who studies graphic novels. So for me, this is a great uh, source uh, because it seems pretty similar, if not almost the same. So I'll follow up on this reference. Um, uh, yeah, because I when I when I applied for this uh, workshop, I said, well, I'm kind of an infiltrate because my knowledge of graphic novels is is very limited. So thank you for that. Um, obviously, there is a connection there, and and I wonder if they are very similar. Then how different are they, right? Um, how how does uh, Barad Barad do this uh, to get away with it? Because this is a very um, popular novel. It's been graphic novel. It's been um, uh, published many times. So I wonder, um, Clement's story must be very canonical, also, right? Uh, Clement's graphic novel has been called the most important alternative yeah. comic. Uh, narrative in the last like 30, 40 years in, in Mexico. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely a very important reference for uh, graphic novels. In and I think Latin it's America. analyzed in the book uh, you quote, Barbara, the book by Joanna Page uh, right. and um, Edward King on mm. uh, graphic novels in Latin America. So any other questions? Fire away, please. I can't see hands up, so just speak up. Oh, 
or I'll ask um, myself. Uh, you mentioned a, a number of other genres, Barbara, like uh, dystopia and the Gothic. Is that something that that uh, sort of unites these these uh, narratives that that you're mentioning in your project? Um, you mentioned the figure of the witch, for example. I mean, you mean the whole the whole project? Yes. Um, the last uh, novel by Baradit is called La Virgen de la Patagonia. Mm -hmm. So it has an element of that, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all the novels uh, have this mm -hmm. aspect. Um, what I'm interested in is, is, is something I'm developing, um, which is the idea of not only um, science fiction or graphic novels is speculative narratives mm -hmm. in a more general sense, because there are certain novels from Chile that could follow under that categorization, but it needs to be flexibilized in that sense. Uh, what is, uh, what do yeah. we refer to as speculative and how do we treat time? Yeah. Uh, what I'm interested in in Baradit's text is that the treatment of time uh, makes it very uncertain. Uh, we don't really know when we are, even though we know we're in Santiago de Chile at all times. And there are landmarks of the city that appear very clearly in the graphics, but we don't know when. Uh, things take place. So in the case of, of the man that's being hunted, uh, it may be around the 1980s or the time during mm -hmm. Pinochet's dictatorship, but we cannot really be sure. So this idea of, of losing the plot yeah. in that sense is, is very important. So does that situate the graphic novel in a sort of a national culture context? Is this a critique of the politics of Chile or is it something wider aimed at, you know, these forces that do not operate only in Chile, like, you know, neoliberalism yeah. or chauvinism, you know? Well, in Chile, we had a, a political uh, event or earthquake uh, very recently, uh, yeah. two days, two or three days yeah. ago. The uh, issue of neoliberalism in Chile is very important. We had a, a revolution in 2019. Uh, the process is still ongoing. There'll be a writing of a new constitution in the country. Um, so I, I believe that there is a direct relationship between the consequences of neoliberalism on Chilean society and how mm. these narratives I've selected treat time. Um, because this idea of the perpetual present that there is no possibility to change show a sheer frustration that also people have felt in the way that society works that, I don't know, maybe the only purpose in life is to get a degree, to be indebted, then to be more in debt, and, and that's it. And use your money to go to the shopping mall and, and you cannot get out of there. So that inescapability is part of every novel I'm studying, including um, Policia del Karma, which is which is the example here. I, I'm, I, I'll, I'll go back to this Mexican novel that's uh, been suggested because I wonder if the sense of inescapability is there too, and if it has to do with the socio-political context, uh, and if it can be related to neoliberalism as well. I'm more focused on the Chilean case uh, because of the way that neoliberalism was imposed, enacted, and developed in the following decades. So when uh, Policia del Karma was published in 2011, by the time that we had student protests, so, so the movements became more and more uh, powerful with each passing year and each passing uh, generation to the point that the leaders of the student movement in 2011 are the people who are in government now with President Gabriel Boric in charge of the country now. So, so these are uh, aspects that are all tied together. And I think that the treatment of time and, and the lack of hope, uh, this post-apocalyptic world is not only part of this graphic novel, but it's part of many, many other Chilean narratives that uh, that treat this because I think it's a matter of uh, of uh, it's a matter of importance, but it's also very urgent to have a look at it because of what's happened uh, very recently. Thank you. Uh, any more questions, people over there? Um, I just mm. wanted uh, she 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 asked if in Operación Bolivar is the same. Uh, absolutely, it's it's the same okay. sense of. There is no way out. Uh, no matter how much heroic are the uh, characters in the novel, there is no way out. There is all this sense of that everything has failed. And actually, Operación Bolívar does not limit its critique to the Mexican uh, society. It has 
such a huge level of intertextuality. It includes, for example, uh, Goya's painting, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the execution of uh, um, the 2nd of May. It includes um, all, it, it's, it has this idea, I think, of Benjamin, you know, the angel of history looking back and seeing all this destruction in human history, I would say, and because angels are part also of uh, the, the novel uh, by Clement is actually, I think I, I, I read it as a huge metaphor of the failure of our societies to build sustainable and humane structures and ways of living. So I would definitely say that it would be very good for you to read Clemens and then mm -hmm. go back to uh, Policia del Karma. And also, um, I think uh, Operación Bolívar, I think is available online. I think uh, Clement made it available online in a PDF, so you can get it very easily. Um, Thank you. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the same as the, the beautiful big edition that the, that the, the graphic novel had, but just for reference, it's right there online yeah. on PDF, so. Yeah, thank you, that's great. I'll look at it. Thank you. Shall we move on then? I'm conscious of time. Uh, so uh, is it okay if we move to our next presenter? Okay, so that will be sure, Isi yeah. Hall. Yeah, sorry? Yes, yes, go on, yes, Mariano. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, perfect timing so far. Uh, so thank you. And uh, Isi Hollingdale is a postgraduate researcher at Newcastle University. She is working on literary representations of the appropriation of babies and children during Franco Spain. She will be reading uh, now uh, a presentation by, um, God, sorry, have it here. Uh, Paula Igareda, Igareda Gonzalez, sorry for that. Uh, so I cannot see now um, easy, but uh, I know she's there, so please uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, but I really enjoyed reading this paper from Paula and it taught, I learned a lot from it. So I hope I have sort of, I sort of managed to present it okay and do it justice because it was a really nice paper. Um, so Paula's aim in this paper is to kind of fill a gap in translation studies regarding research and teaching of languages. And she offers at the end of the paper, a series of examples of images from comics um, from like feminist genres of comics and proposes that these can kind of act as a tool for learning and teaching languages through translation. And in, in translating these texts, the learner will not only be able to be working with written text, but also the texts bring in cultural, sociological, and ideological aspects. And within this aim, there's a dual purpose in that it offers an analysis of these texts and illustrations to attest to the importance of translating them into other languages. But it also has a secondary purpose of proposing innovative and new materials for learning language through translation. So to start with, she talks, she talked about female, about women and comics. And she notes that comics by women that have been translated into other languages, which would thereby encourage greater international recognition are scarce. Um, and in the case of Spanish language works by women, the success achieved by works like Women on the Edge by Maitena Burundarena is mainly due to the fact that they deal with universal themes such as the female world or relationships problems, um, and these are the kind of issues that are, dealt, that are reflected in the daily lives of millions of people across the world. So instead of embedding cultural references for the local, it's offering themes that are applicable to a wider global audience. She then moves on to talking about how we translate comics. And when we do that, the graphic and phonetic characteristics of the genre can pose challenges to a translator because they have to not only translate these written tropes, these written words, but also the visual tropes that are present. So translators become this kind of semiotic investigator because they have to be aware that the meaning in comics is created by relationships of dialogue between verbal and nonverbal messages. Um, comics within teaching offer several advantages. 
So they stimulate creativity and enhance reading skills and language learning as students retain complex words through association with image. And for the foreign language learner, they're even more beneficial and are recommended by the Common European Framework for Reference for Languages as authentic material. And they allow students to work on listening, reading, writing and oral skills all at once. So it offers, it also offers the opportunity for students reading a foreign comic to learn more about the culture of the origin of, that, of the comic. They're also very useful in the acquisition of translation competence, such as um, off, they offer skills like communicative and textual competence, which means that whilst the student gets to grips with the source text, they must also become familiar with the oral register and textual typology of the comic. And then there is also the cultural subcompetence that you can enhance through comics representing certain aspects of a source culture, which contain a wealth of cultural information too. Things like jokes that the trainee will then need to acknowledge and reflect upon in their translation. It also offers the opportunity to enhance teamwork and problem solving. So what I really liked in the paper was it offers a very clear and structured descriptions um, of the characteristics of the material of comics, which I found really useful for me who does not have much background in that at this stage. I found that really useful. And I think it's really important to include those kind of things to make the paper so much more accessible to people who maybe don't have all of that knowledge. Um, I also thought it was a really important and useful contribution um, to this field and also to translation studies because it shows the benefits of using comic in translation and it doesn't just focus on the sort of traditional benefits about how it enhances what we learn um, but also about the fun and attractive aspects of comics which makes it different but also really enticing. And I think using the feminist comic as a lens was a really interesting way to introduce the topic um, because these are things that we see across social media. And as a young woman who uses Instagram a lot, and I see a lot of those comics on Instagram. Um, and so I think it's a really poignant moment to be investigating them um, when they are really gaining ground. Um, and it also adds another layer to the kind of cultural coding that translators will have to unpack when they start working with this material. Um, and some things I thought could maybe add to the paper were um, maybe looking at the cultural norms that have led to so few comics written by women or that address feminist issues being translated and globally distributed, whether you kind of just included some research, some other research on that, or you did your own work on that. And you could even unravel some broader themes like inequality in translation and compare that maybe with the translation of male comics that appear on social media or elsewhere. Um, and I also thought you looking at the power of social media would be interesting. And you could even speak to authors and artists to learn why they chose those platforms over um, sort of self-publishing, even though obviously uploading to social media is a lot simpler than a publication. And um, I thought it would be interesting to maybe, if you could speak to creators and find out what led them down that path and whether that has and whether there was a specific reason they chose a specific social media channel um, and why they think that kind of works with the themes that they're expressing. Um, but I really enjoyed the, the piece. And yeah, like I said, it was really um, useful for me personally to learn from. Um, I've learned a lot from it, so thank you. No, thank you. It sounds better <laughs> when she explains it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> No, sorry, go ahead. Thank you. And, no, yeah, uh, I was just thanking her, no, because it, it really does sound uh, much better, no, the way I, I was enjoying your your critical reading, uh, because it, it really has to uh, be someone with the patience and the courage to, to no, order all my uh, chaotic thoughts. Uh, written in that piece of paper. I don't know if many of you have uh, read it, but it was just an attempt to, to, to bring something here and to get some, some, no, some uh, new ideas. And I think you're young and I don't know, more order uh, brain uh, helped me uh, a lot. Um, I don't know what else to say. You, you, were, you were talking about, um, 
Uh, that comparison inequality, I, I really have to, or oh, that would be a great idea to uh, make that kind of uh, comparison and um, to, to try to talk uh, to those women and to ask them why the social media, I guess there are um, easy uh, answers to that in some cases, but uh, maybe not in all. Uh, them. I, I did uh, contact with some of them and uh, asked them if they have uh, thought about uh, the possibility of translate uh, uh, their works into other languages, such as English, for example. And uh, well, it's not uh, obviously, you know, it's not an easy job. It's not a uh, it's something that they, they, they can they have to control no or even their own uh, publishers uh, but yeah it's just an idea I think it's more than a study and proven that uh, using this kind of text uh, as a learning teaching uh, tool is uh, it's a very good way no um, there was uh, a time in my life where, and I'm still tired of uh, having, uh, we were talking about that uh, the other day having uh, dinner, but having that feeling that I have to justify uh, being an outsider. No, I come from the audiovisual translation uh, uh, studies and audiovisual translation was always uh, treat or name as a constraint translation. And the same is happening to me uh, now with comics, but I am old enough to say that that's enough. No, we were saying stop justifying uh, what you're doing. I'm also tired of uh, using boring uh, materials uh, when teaching, <laughs> translation, and also just to learn new languages. And again, comic was my, my solution. And I'm also tired of seeing how many uh, women authors um, illustrators or writers are neglected or how many of them are just unseen, no? how much talent uh, is just lost in a man world. No? So I decided that would be like my contribution, not this uh, way of activism, no, just one person. You know? But again, if I start here, maybe there are more women than men who want to follow me in their no, um, intimacy of their, your classes, no? Uh, and uh, let's do that, not just uh, teaching translation and everything that you really uh, caught in my paper, not just uh, teaching languages in something else, no? Let's talk about feminism. Let's talk about many other social issues that uh, are very important. Let's talk about history, politics, no? That's it. I don't know if you have any more comments. We are all tired, no? I'm not the only one. I'm tired because of that. I'm tired. I, I have a, a comment, yeah. Um, Paula, thank you very much for your for your paper. Really, I really enjoyed it, and also for Isis' presentation because it really uh, makes justice to the to the paper. Yes, but it's a wonderful presentation as well. Um, I like the approach in your paper. I mean, it, it was very much in the with the ethos of the training school, like you know, reflections, ideas, throwing this and that, uh, rather than a fully fleshed paper that is almost you know contained and you cannot you know do anything with it. Uh, my question is. Two questions. I mean, one is, um, have you tried this already with a group of students? Uh, and what, what is the result of trying this out? And the second question is, particularly with the translation and, and intercultural translation, when you use authors who are not um, authors from other countries and you use them you know, in translation with your students, um, I'm very curious about the intercultural aspect of translation. What elements do translate well to Spanish students, what elements need extra input on your side to help them understand certain elements, certain cultural elements that may be taken for granted, you know, in, in Norway, in, in other places, yeah. Yeah. Uh, related, well, in regards to the first questions, uh, to, the, to the first one, uh, I haven't tried, not yet, that was the idea, 
uh, to to ask you: Is this a good idea? It's just crazy, no? Thinking about great that idea. Don't be no, yeah. <laughs> but to 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 use this Spanish-speaking texts, no, uh, uh, with students, as uh, how can I put it? Yeah, with uh, Spanish learners. I haven't done that. I don't know if what, that was a question because I don't work in that anymore. So I used to be a, a teacher for uh, uh, students of Spanish as a second language, but not anymore. So that would be an idea to, to, to give to other people. But what I really do is the other way to, to use this text in translation class and what they do with how, how, how to deal with all these uses uh, uh, when translating. And it's working with very simple samples. Regarding your second question, yes, that's where I have more experience translating from German into Spanish using uh, German graphic novels and uh, which aspects uh, needs more, no? Like an explanation from the professor in this uh, case. Normally, uh, topics dealing with history. So apart from the linguistic problems that we can find, normally history or some cultural references that may need uh, further explanations. That's my experience so far. Hmm. Um, I have a quick question and, and comment. Um, I really like sort of the impulse behind that idea, right? So in that sort of audiovisual translation through the medium of the graphic novel or the comics, do you think that also is a matter of mediation as well, not only translation? Because, um, I mean, in, in that sort of uh, visual language text, in a way, is a limited part of it, right? There is a lot of different levels of communication going. So in a way, you don't need language to translate, but you might need some other kind of translation going. So I'm thinking, um, is it not straightforward linguistic? Is not straightforward cultural, but it is a way of mediating sort of understanding and also aesthetics, right? I mean, there are something pleasing aesthetically for somebody that grew up watching a certain kind of, you know, drawing or line or use of color or so on. And so you have to sort of adapt that as well. Yeah, um, the thing is, uh, yeah, first, maybe we have to uh, bring some introduction to the texts and explaining, especially to all these people that are not used to deal with this kind of texts. No? I, I hate to use that word because for me, graphic novels and comics are everything but text. Mm -hmm. And uh, to help them to see that, uh, yeah, all those aspects of those uh, elements, such as how to see the literature, how to see the music, how to see the theater, the dance, the cinema, the photography, all those elements that this thing that I want to bring you in class. Ah, so, yeah. I have to be that translator, interpreter. Um, oh, is there another question? No, please, go ahead. Uh, Paola, thanks a, a lot for this paper. Uh, it resonated with my teaching uh, Spanish and Dutch to, as a second language in the past. Uh, and I was reading, I, I remember reading the CFR, Common European Framework, I already got a little bit of stress because that was, it's very prescriptive. And I can imagine that you're very tired of those A1, A2, B1. Okay, anyway, uh, I've had the pleasure to work with um, two Swedish um, scholars who've come up with a new book, Teaching with Comics. And I was just going through the uh, chapter, oh, like their table of contents. And there's one um, chapter in there that you might be interested in. If you want to, I can send you. 
because it's like 119 euros per not we are no está no estamos grabando okay I will pass you the, the yes, link. Please. I think it can be interesting. Yeah, yeah. of course. But Thank you. I, I, about the common European framework, I just have to ask this. Uh, how do you work with that? What, I mean, who, who do you teach when you're translating? At what level are you translating? With people of well, the last year of... Uh, And what did they have? C1? Mm, not really. B2. So B2. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise it would be a very difficult exercise to do with them okay. if they would have like a, yeah, something not that high. One really quick one. Um, I, I work similarly alongside the Canaries and other interests in the Balearics, especially in sort of the multiple languages that they have there, especially Mallorquin, Menorquin, Spanish, English, German, which appear across different sort of cartoons. I was wondering, Are there any examples of these that use multiple languages that could be used in the context in the context of translation? Sort of work across, say, for example, how you tackle translating a cartoon that might use both or a comic that might use both Catalan and Spanish, for instance. Are there any examples of that that you've come across that might also be applied to this? Mm, there might be, of course. I can't think of any right now, but yeah. But I was finishing uh, before coming here uh, Soy la Malinche. Yes, nothing to do with uh, the languages that you were mentioning, but it is a beautiful um, way of um, dealing, I don't know if you know, it is written by uh, or, or created by the, uh, Alicia Jaraba, and it deals with many different uh, languages and uh, And with translation within the graphic novel, and I, I wonder how would they um, translate that into other languages such as whatever French, German, English? Because if you do translate that, you would destroy. Talking about dubbing, right? Yeah. Yeah. You would destroy everything. But no, I can't think about it. Anymore. I don't think so. I don't It's think pretty I, new. I don't yeah, think so. I, I'm, no. Just one other thing that I forgot to mention. I saw that you quoted Zanetin, who's a translator, I guess. Uh, but there's uh, also comic scholars who talk, who were talking about how translation is part of a domestication of a certain product. And one a very good scholar on that is Casey Brienza, although she talks about manga. And uh, mm -hmm. U.S. comics, I think you might find the her her definition of domestication something to look into. Like I will pass you the source as well. And also, also um, Javier Muñoz Basols, the Enrique del Rey, they have published as well on translation, on using, on comics translation, yes, uh, for pedagogic purposes, yeah. Well, that could be useful, yeah. Sorry, Muñoz. Javier Muñoz Basols hmm. and Enrique del Rey Cabrera. They've got a paper on on translating comics. Yeah, I can I can pass it on to you. Thank you. You want me to work? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that was the point of being here. I am joking. Any other questions? I cannot see any more hands over okay. here, Mariano. Any more hands? Okay. Uh, Paula, I have I have one question then. Uh, so uh, you were talking about uh, a combination of things, no? Uh, it's um, translation as a tool for teaching languages, then uh, comic books as a tool for, well, as, an, as a uh, sort of um, instrument that, that uh, you'd say would uh, uh, appeal to students. We all want to make our classes less boring, whatever it is we are, we are teaching. And then no, a combination of the two, teaching uh, Spanish in this case, through the translations of, of comic books. You, you already answered no, uh, Jorge's questions about um, uh, implementing that in the classroom. What, what, but what were, what were your main challenges, for example, in doing this? Uh, 
Do you ask students to buy uh, the graphic novel? Do you distribute them in class, uh, you know, parts of the, of the novel? It's a more practical question. No, since I'm, well, since I'm just enjoying myself teaching, okay. from, yeah. no, bringing something in class, yeah. uh, what I want it to, well, to, to contribute a little bit with this uh, scenario that we have right now, at least in, in Spain and with all the people that I mentioned in my paper, uh, writing and creating in Spanish, is to just uh, bring a little help. If I make that many more people know these uh, authors, mm -hmm. maybe this would help them I mean, the authors to be translated or just to be a little bit more, no, mm -hmm. knowledge, known. That's what I can, the only thing I can do so far because I don't have the money or not the power to go to the publishing no, uh, houses and say, hey, let's do something with these people. You are missing a lot here. No, you, you have no idea what you are missing. I can't do that because I, I'm, closed in my no, school at university, but maybe with his no, little job, I can, I can help them. I Great, wish. you're laying the first stone in a revolutionary system, oh, yeah. but that's, that's good. We have to start somewhere. Um, it's uh, four almost. Uh, Jorge, should we bring this session to a close? If you, you don't mind, Mariano, there is one last question. Oh, absolutely, yes, yes. Okay, For Diana, a, more, and then we can draw it to a close, yeah. Thank yes. you much. More than a question, it's, more, it's a comment, and a thank you very much. I didn't know about this comic, Soy la Malinche, from Alicia Jaraba. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just look for it. Thank you very much. And it's a really nice way to, to change the, the, the data because uh, Malinche has been considered a straighter, and she was mostly translator. So it's a nice way to working about translator with the translator itself. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? I think that, that no. was it, Mariano. Okay, well, uh, for me, this was uh, really excellent, an excellent session. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the panelists, Barbara, Athena, Isi, and, uh, and Paula. Excellent timekeeping. So you made my uh, job easier. And I think uh, this has been productive for uh, everyone here, no? for the presenters, for those who have uh, you know, uh, their papers questions, but for the rest as well. Uh, certainly, I will be thinking about a lot of uh, issues like using more uh, comics in my, in my classes and um, uh, showing Paula in this um, revolutionary movement. Uh, if my uh, students are um, entertained, they will be grateful. Uh, and um, I'm also envious of all of you there physically present in Newcastle. Now you'll get to enjoy the film screening, then dinner and so on. But um, I, I don't know, have you been uh, offering rounds of applause to the presenters and everybody involved? I, I would suggest to do that. Uh, Barbara, for Barbara, for uh, Athena, Isi and Paula. Well, thank you very much. Jorge, over to you. Thank you, Mariano. Thanks a lot for sharing this, uh, this workshop, this uh, final session. Um, thank you, Barbara, uh, those who have joined online throughout these three days of the training school. Um, we have finished with the panels and with the papers. 